Hello, I'm Steve Ryder and welcome back to Racing Weekly, a podcast and YouTube show brought to you by Odds Checker in association with Bet365. We've had a short break since the Cheltenham Review show uh, and Rishi decided that he needed another week on holiday. So I've moved chairs into the hosting chair, but thankfully we've got a couple of great guests to then go through it with me. Johnny Ward, friend of the show, how are you? I'm very well, uh, good to be back. Yeah, I thought, oh, thought it was good to bring an Irishman in, particularly for the, yeah. uh, for the, for the Grand National itself. With the, the Irish Grand the National, as it should probably be known, but yeah, uh, yeah we'll, uh, we'll have a, we'll have, we don't have the favourite, but we have, um, obviously the numbers are a little bit alarming from the British perspective. Yeah, definitely. And Hayley Moore, first time on for just over a year now, it was the Cambridgeshire you were last yeah. on with Sam and Richard. Yeah, that seemed like a long time ago, um, but it's good to be here. I think you're a much better replacement than Rishi as well, <laughs> so um, we won't let him hear that. I don't know. It's good, good to be here. There's been a, a busy time in the like the racing world with obviously the start of the flat and the jump. So you do feel like your head's all over the place. But still, it's a good time of year, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's going to be a bit of a strange show. We're going to be here, there and everywhere with regards to reviews uh, and previews. And, and obviously, at the time of recording, we're, we're just getting the declarations through for the for the Thursday. So we'll go through that. But we have to start the show, obviously, with um, with condolences to the family and friends of Stefano Kirky, obviously the, the, the sad passing. And Hayley, I'll probably come to you with this. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've probably um, had more to deal with him on the race course than, than what Johnny and I would have done. Yeah, I had the pleasure of greeting him in the winner's enclosure, which is always a lovely place. And one of the best things about my job is you get to talk to the happy connections. And he always seemed a very kind, smiley person anyway, but obviously he was delighted. It would be sort of like a, a low key meeting. It's like Brighton um, and it was just lovely to hear the involvement the hours that he'd put in in the morning riding horses out and then getting the results on the racetrack it meant a lot to him and he just seemed like a really lovely character and so I only know him sort of through a professional sense but got a lot of mutual friends and they've been showing me videos of him and he just seemed like he had such a wonderful character really sharp loved banter you know having a good laugh with people and what they loved most of all was how even though he spoke English as a second language that he would sort of take on like little throwaway comments or oh, mate you know like just little and he just seemed like he was like the life and soul of the party and I've learned a lot more about him since his passing sadly and I think it, it's gonna he's, he's gonna be remembered for a very long time because he's lived a, a short life but he's made a big impact on a lot of people so um very much thoughts with his family because obviously they've had a wonderful son and um, did a lot of traveling very good rider and it's just sad that his life's been cut short and it left a very um, horrible feeling sort of over the last couple of weeks really learning that he was in a very bad way and it's just heartbreaking that he's not been able to pull through. Yeah and this has just been some fantastic messages that you can read through and I, I spent about an hour just reading through everyone's, uh, Callum Shepherd's particularly, yeah. you know, just talking about the person rather than the jockey and I think, like you touched on it, it was the quick wit in, yes. in his, I suppose, second language that, yeah. that is the thing that's really kind of shone through. So, yeah. yeah, from everyone at the Racing Weekly team, yeah, our, our dearest and sincerest uh, condolences. Um, but we'll get on to um, a few bits in our first section, which is Racing Recap. So the first race to go through in Racing Recap will be the Irish Grand National. Obviously a fantastic winner with intense raffles, a really good story. Obviously, for Tom Gibney winning this 12 years on from last success in the race. Johnny, I'll come to you first. A, a brilliant ride, I thought, also for, for JJ Slevin deputising. Yeah, Steve, like the, the both rider and jockey to have two winners in the race is it kind of um it kind of sums up this race in that it, it has um been swimming against the national hunt tide in that like it just hasn't become dominated by the big yard for whatever reason. Um, you know, you have small yards winning this regularly, and I'm not sure why. And this horse is well fancied. Um, I was, it was strange. I, I was, I was, I was went into my local of a Wednesday a few months back to watch Dundalk, and I live in Dublin. And Tom Gibney was there, and I was like, "What, what are you doing here?" Right. So he's a we have a, a mutual friend who lives nearby, but he'd gone to Haydock to watch his horse, this horse he'd gotten from France, run, but the meeting had been called off. So he'd flown back that day. He was given out that the meeting was called off that morning, but I think it was frost, and it happened very late in the, late in the day. He said, I want to bring this horse over to England to see what sort of mark he got, or whatever it was anyway. And he said, I'm in Dublin because it's my daughter's birthday tonight, so I'm killing a bit of time here. So I said, how did you get a horse for Isaac Swade and Simon Muneer? And this was 
intense raffles. Then he runs them at Fairy House. I was there, uh, wins, runs them again at Fairy House to actually get into the national. But because it's kind of a weird national this year, he would have gotten in anyway. And then he's carrying 13 pounds higher. So like, this is a disaster. Like you, you're carrying nearly a stone higher on awful ground and he wins. And it was great. It was like absolutely great. And both he and I know the way you're thinking, we'll talk about later on. I think they're both potential Gold Cup horses. You know, why not? Um, the national, considering the weight that he had on atrocious ground as well, Haley, like it was so bad. And he's only a six year old. Um, I guess the question mark is how will he handle better ground, but um, for Tom Gibney to have a winner like this, and I, I think, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but I think he felt that he was going to get a horse for them, and then he thought the time had gone, but then they came back to him, and it's just so good for racing to have a story like this, and for Lance Tower. Yeah, especially for for an owner like Manier and Sway to, mm. to send them. Obviously, the majority of horses with really runnings now, and, mm. and for them to then yeah choose to send one to Tom Gidney, I, I thought was yeah a fantastic story. I suppose another story in the race would be any second now. What a fantastic horse for Ted Walsh! Obviously, finished second in two Aintree Grand Nationals, uh, or placed in two Grand Nationals, uh, and second in the Irish National. I, I thought yeah he was a fantastic performance. Yeah, and he didn't. Um, disgrace his connections at all, wasn't beaten far. Obviously, we had New Kid on the block who's come over from France, and that's probably the real story of the race because it was like Johnny said, it, it was a bit baffling. You know, where's this horse come from? Yeah. And, and being a novice into that kind of company. But um, I think Ted Walsh just continues to be able to get the best out of whatever horse he's given, really, year after year. And especially when it comes to a national, he, he knows how to bring these horses on. And it was a great run in defeat in what looked really extreme conditions mm. but um yeah simon manier and isaac suede who bred this horse as well i think it meant the world to them um to see this horse be campaigned over in france they conditioned it and i guess that's why when you look back through how this horse has been bought through his career it wasn't a big shock because they've done you know, they've started early in france like they do and mm. obviously they've the right one over so um it meant a lot to the, the winning connections it was a, a great race and um, it just looked really hard work out there this year yeah and any second now um story is quite strange as well because he was rated 160 in march of last year hadn't run hadn't run that much had 167 bha rating in the national he ran off 140 like he was literally dropped i've never seen a horse drop like this in ireland um, and nearly won the race he got in of 140 having been 20 pounds higher only a few runs previously that just does not happen in ireland um and that that was also an interesting to take out the race so it was probably an allowance made for the fact that he was a 12 year old but um I, I thought it was it was quite unique the way he was treated yeah no definitely but the, the eye was definitely drawn for to intense raffles throughout the whole race mm. obviously a, sl a slight mistake at the fourth, like the fourth last but entitled to do that obviously with his with his experience so, yeah some sympathy for Daryl Jacob who obviously would have ridden yeah. the horse but JJ Slevin rode um, general principal to win in the race he, and I, I did a live show with him recently where he was talking about how he was kind of he, he got that ride in general principal purely by default and it was kind of just just it wasn't like even connections had massive faith that um, you know he was going to win, but but this was more like he's actually developed a relationship with these owners, yeah. um, and JJ is developing into an outstanding rider. Yeah, yeah, that relationship with the Crawfords is uh, has definitely mm. got him that right, hasn't it? That's just hard work. Like the yeah. Crawfords are based up in in Larne, um, and like JJ is down in like that's a long, long drive from where he is, and hard work paying off. And um, he thinks a lot about the game. Did a fascinating interview in the racing post with Patrick Mullins about his riding style from the weighing room in Gorn recently, which is well worth reading as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll then move on to a grade, a grade one, obviously the Honeysuckle Mares, Novice Erdl, Jade de Grugy. Uh, I, I was surprised she ran so quickly after Cheltenham yeah. Hayley, but, but brilliant performance. Looked in trouble, but stayed on really well at the finish. That two and a half miles is definitely what she needs. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously been always following her career intensely because it's very complicated, but she is the, the dam is the on-race half-sister to good old side of Grugy so um, always watched her career with great interest and obviously bred from the same place Le, Le Grungerie Le Grugerie back over in France a lovely family and um, I was disappointed with her at Cheltenham um, I thought she was a bit too keen for one just whatever reason the occasion I don't know if it got to her or whatever but it was great to see her and I was really hoping she was gonna land it at, at Cheltenham so then to see her out only last week or so you know I was just like really um but obviously she's tough and the 
performance she put in, it was great to see. So um, like you, surprised, and it was just nice to see her get back on track for Kenny Alexander. And um, I think she's going to be really exciting and to come out and get things right. I don't know, maybe like she must have been showing them at home that she was fine and for whatever reason it didn't happen at, at um, Cheltenham, but she came back and was better than ever. So I'm sure with, with time and trip, she's going to get better and better. And see her over them fences as well in time. So yeah, she's really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Five, five to one second favourite at Bet365 for the Mayor's Hurdle at the Cheltenham Festival next season. There were a few at the Fairy House Festival that had ran at Cheltenham which underperformed. So that probably, you could you could probably mark us up a bit higher, Johnny. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd give I'd give the horses an out. Like we're living in extraordinary times with the weather here and to go over to Cheltenham notwithstanding how difficult the ground was and come back, um, it's always a risk. I, I actually find like this particular time of year and to an extent Punchestown Horses who've run at Cheltenham might always be wary of them going back into... Because mainly horses are trained for Cheltenham. They're not trained for two weeks after Cheltenham. They're trained to peak there, and Punchestown is kind of like an afterthought. Um, so horses that disappointed us, Fairy House who ran at Cheltenham, I'd, I'd be readily giving them an out. Yeah. Uh, the other grade one uh, festi- uh, Fairy House was, was the Willow Warm Gold Cup. Spillane's Tower, obviously a fantastic um, performance for Jimmy Mangan. Uh, yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah, How was- high can he go? Well, how far can he go is the question, I think. Like, because if I don't know, Walk in the Park is a funny one for me. Like, I've never seen a National Hunt stallion as expensive as he is, and he's standing at something like 25 grand. It's, it's incredible money, and it all came out of Duvan and Min coming around at the same time. But when he was sent to these sort of National Hunt bred mares, then eventually, and if, if, if they can stay, like, I know the way you're thinking. If they, if they can stay extreme trips, I, I find a lot of walking the parks have so much class that they're, they're going to be very good. If he can stay three miles, um, the way he races, you sort of think he, he can. Um, I, I, I thought it was a fine ride by Mark Walsh. One thing I'd say about J.P. McMahon is like he's, his tax status is often controversial in Ireland, and I, I have my own views on that, which aren't really relevant here. But in terms of the way he um, treats racing, in terms of almost this sort of egalitarian, altruistic system of giving, giving loads of trainers a horse. This means everything to Jimmy Mangan to have a horse with disability. You know, and Jigginstown had a completely different model where it went to like five trainers and then very even fewer again. For Spillane's Tower, like what this meant to the yard and he's well able to train a horse. Um, I don't know, Haley. I often wonder as well, if you, if you have a small, if you have a small yard and you have like a very good horse, like why would he be any worse off there than anywhere else? You know what I mean? Yeah, You're going to yeah, get so yeah. much attention. That's right. Yeah, he'll be um, be spoiled. Whereas mm. you kind of look at someone like Willie Mullins, he's got a whole yard full of those horses, mm. and I think that's probably quite stressful, if anything. But who um, was spoiled in the Morehouse actually? Um, who spoiled? Who was spoiled? Who, who was the one? Side of Rougie was <laughs> most, more, more so than any child um, going. So yeah, it's that's fair enough. Horses actually. before people in our household, and um, but it was great for Jimmy Mangan because he seems like a real popular character mm. on the Irish racing circuit, and I think it's it's probably harder when you're a smaller trainer. As much as you can give them the attention to detail. I think there probably is more pressure. You, you might not have the horses around to compare them to. You, you so probably, much is weighing on it. Yeah, you know what I mean, that's like it, mentally yeah. and everything is. Yeah. Whereas you know, if you've got twenty good horses, you'll probably have a bit more confidence in yourself and you, you get on with it. Whereas you're probably thinking a bit more, so it's probably mm. quite stressful when you've got one really good one. But yeah, you can give them plenty of attention to detail. But fair play to them because they didn't take this horse off to Cheltenham, which they could have done. They waited, stayed in Ireland into one, a grade one, as mm. prestigious as that. I mean, that that's amazing. You know, he's a wonderful trainer anyway, but it's good to see him back there with a horse at the top level. And I think it's harder for a smaller trainer to you know, to have these, because they haven't got the numbers there, quite mm. simply, mm. and then um, to get them right on the day and have everything. And I think Mark Walsh was speaking in terms of this horse of... Uh, glowing accolade mm. afterwards, you know, really exciting horse as well, even from here. So, um, yeah, be be fascinated to continue to follow his career and and how they're going to campaign him as well. Because I mean, that was a huge achievement for the, for the Mangans. It's down to owners, really. Like the whole yeah. state of racing is down to where the owner wants to put the horse. Um, I I I know it's been said it's 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 cyclical and all of that, but I, I actually feel. There's a major argument for owners to train horses in Britain at the moment because it's not as competitive and um, the prize money isn't as bad as people think relative to Ireland. 
they have some fine trainers, fine, fine trainers in Britain that will, you'll be avoiding Willie Mullins with good horses. Um, and that's what it's down to. Like Caldwell Potter was bought for Paul Nichols for seven and seven and forty grand or whatever it was. I hope that what happened at Cheltenham with regard to Shake 'em Up Harry and Sir Alex Ferguson and Harry Redknapp having winners, I think that should wake up people over here to say like we need to get these owners involved in the game here because British racing hasn't gone away. And it's easier to win good race in Britain than it is in Ireland. If you if the owner's willing to give the horse to the to a trainer the trainer can deliver. It's, it doesn't have to be with Willie Mullins, if you know what I mean. Yeah, Gavin Cromwell, obviously. Mm. Uh, uh, Look at the way he's campaigned his horses uh, here. Exactly. Coming over and targeting the big pots over here as well. Um, one that did the reverse of that, though, is brewing up a storm. Obviously went across to Ireland, trained by Ollie Murphy, mm. uh, winning a grade two. Um, renewing, obviously, partnership with, with Jack Kennedy um, mm. from, obviously, when he was assistant trainer for Gordon Elliott. He, he described this as, in, he enjoyed this as much as any winner I've trained, which I thought said a lot. Yeah, um, and it... I think he adores this horse and um, it's worked out well for him. I think they had saved some fresh ground, particularly for Brewing Up a Storm, to line up at Fontwell. And obviously, that's just been a, a nightmare of a, a race course this whole yeah. season. I do mm. feel for Philip Hyde, the amount of abandonments we've had down there. It's been so wet. Um, and they you know, really look forward to seeing a horse of his calibre come back again to try and land the grade two, but unfortunately the meeting fell by the wayside. So I thought, fair play to the team for, pink, for thinking of a plan B so quickly and to go over to Ireland and win it. And obviously they found the right race. Um, I don't think it was obviously staring anyone in the face, um, especially taking on Irish opposition for a start. So I thought, um, I thought it was wonderful placing from Ollie Murphy and everyone involved in finding the right race for this horse. Loves soft ground. Um, I think Lingfield was probably the other one on his agenda. Mm. And unfortunately, I think that was when we were going through the frozen period. So um, obviously, Ollie Murphy's finishing off the season really well. Horses running brilliantly. Lots of winners. I think he'll have some nice chances up at Aintree as well. So it was just great to see him. Obviously, spent a lot of time alongside Gordon Elliott mm. um, learning his trade and um, to take a horse over there. I thought it was great, really good finish. Felt, of course, for Aidan Coleman. Um, normally, he'd have been riding him. Um, maybe then Sean Bowen, you know, it's all this. So it was nice that he could then give Jack Kennedy um, the, the ride and it all work out really well. So, yeah, really nice performance. Yeah, good performance. Your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I felt, I mean, the Devils coachman just shock, uh, ran a shocker again as he had at Gorn and Zarek the Brave. I'm not really sure he wants this trip, so I think it sort of fell into Bruno Upstrong's lap. But, you know, Ollie Murphy would have felt, uh, I think as a trainer, um, and he'd admit this himself, like he did get a head start uh, relative to other trainers in terms of just the resources that he had and some good horses. So I think victories like this mean an awful lot to him, you know, and... Obviously, when he comes back here, taking on a Gordon Elliott uh, horse and providing Jack with the winner, Jack is still very much in the title race as well, would have meant the world to him because, um, you know, when I was going racing down the years, Ollie was regularly in the in the press room with us and we got to know him very well and he's well-liked in Ireland. Yeah, and then there's a few other performances to note at Fairy House, the likes of Mirazir West and Journey With Me. I was particularly taken by Bottler Secret. I, I thought he was really good in the that. juvenile herd. The last time we were we were here, the two of us seated here, sat here and we were talking about... Um, uh, a juvenile who turned out to be basically a little bit disappointing in Burdett Road. Or may maybe he's, maybe he'll have his day yet, but he, I remember saying I think this horse is a great bet for the Triumph. Obviously, he didn't rock up there, but um, this is the, the juvenile that I've latched on to since, Bottler Secrets. I was interviewing Gavin for um, an Irish Field Cheltenham magazine in, I want to say, February, and he's like, this horse, Bottler Secret, he's come off Kieran Murphy, he's really, really like him. And he rocked up in a race in Mace, and um, he was putting six to one the night before with an odds on favourite. And I was like, a four to nine favourite and six to one. I was like, I'm not even sure this horse is going to go off second favourite here. The favourite was scratched. He won that race, but it was still hard to know what he'd achieve. I did back him on, on Monday, but he was friendless in the betting. And I, they put on cheek pieces to give him kind of, um, just to get him to wake up a bit because he races behind the bridle. But he was exceptional. I thought he jumped. Everything was brilliant. And... Um, I asked Gavin Cromwell, how does he compare to Aspar Dallin? And he just replied, different to whatever that means. Yeah, but I think he'll be, he's going to have a big career, this lad. Very good horse in terms of his flat speed as well. So it could be a good race for him to win there. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that headgear going back on. I think mm. he won his final start on the flat in, yeah. in Blinkers, didn't he? And then yeah. they switched it to cheap pieces. Um, so. You mentioned as well um, Mirazor West. He's a brother to Fernie Hollow, who was kind of... Um, Fernie Hollow would have won the champion chase, I think, this year, the way it yeah. fell apart. Like, he actually just would have, if, if yeah. he, but he's very fragile. Mirazor West is a funny one because um, he is quite keen and he's getting a bit like his brother in that regard. But they changed the tactics. He just went out in front and kind of... He just did the job quite well, but I, I really feel over fence he's going to be a different animal. Yeah. Heidi, anything to note for you? From um, I was just pleased to see Kean Collins' mare, Epinoch Fizz, mm. come out on top. Massive odds, 33 to 1. And um, we've seen her visit these shores in Britain a few times, and um, I just thought it was a great bit of training. Um, like Great ride as well from a, a young up-and-coming yeah. rider. Mm. I've uh, got the fraction spot on, and it was just lovely to see her come back to form in a good, you know, valuable race as well, and getting another bit of black type. And she's obviously quite tough and hardy, um, had plenty of racing in her career. And I just thought it was, it was lovely to see. Obviously, um, he's not been training that long, he used to be a very accomplished Doing rider. Well. Um, yeah. I remember, like, he used to ride horses like to plot in shed, and mm. um, unfortunately, I think forced in, he had to. Uh, pack up riding and yeah I think he's doing really well so um, I've, he's always a trainer I, I follow with interest and I think he plays his horses nicely so it's just nice to see her come back and win a, a good race on a, a good card. Yeah particularly makes me laugh when yeah the commentators I, I think something along the lines of Effinock Fizz is going to be swallowed up here and then yeah. she just keeps, keeps battling going, on and yeah, I thought yeah right. too right well yeah, done. Yeah. She put a hoof up to <laughs> yeah, the commentator. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, we also had some good action this weekend. Obviously, it was majority of it on the all weather with the weather. Mm. Um, Snowdrop Philly States. We had Adelaide's beating Choisir by a head to win for, for Joseph O'Brien. Like Johnny, like you said, obviously uh, another Irish trainer targeting some of that UK prize money. Yeah, we we had. Um, I I think we actually need to, to discuss the narrative around um, prize money at the moment because with with regard to the exchange rate and and everything else, like and particularly the way. British racing has kind of earmarked particular races where we're going to have a much bigger pot here, and it is attracting people over. It's some of the pri the prize money in Ireland is the more I look at it, the more I think it's 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 um, it's not as good as people think. And it was actually interesting the day the Galmoy hurdle when Monkfish won. The same day Gavin Cromwell went over to win a mare's chase with Jeremy's. Uh, flame. I, I can't remember exactly where it was. It was one of the lower English tracks. And she won a lot more when the listed mares chase than he did for when the grade two over hurdles for senior horses that day. And um, it was the same day, um, it, it was actually, sorry, it was the Dylan Thomas horse, Brides, Brides Hill that won that day. But he'd won a... Huntington. Yeah, Huntington. He'd won a two, won a two years in a row. And the prize money was actually down from the year before. But if you can pick and choose, um, there, there's good prize money to be won in, in Britain. And uh, yeah, this is a nice performance from Adelaide's. Um, came over... Um, I think it was William Buick's maybe second winner for Joseph, something mm -hmm. like that, but very, very good ride. And um, I, don't know, I think Kempton's a fascinating track as well to watch because if you're, I don't know, if you're, it, it's such a kind of, um, when you're coming into the straight, you're like, what's going to happen here? Have I gotten the fractions right? And it's always kind of um, open to a closer, but did the job in, in nice fashion. Yeah, definitely. Um, Hayley, I want to come on to Notable Speech. That was the one mm. performance on that card that really kind of blew me away. Yeah. It's now 10 to 1 with Bet365 for the 2,000 guineas. It, it's a bit of a fascinating guineas. You've got City of Troy right up there, and then you've got a couple of horses coming in that have kind of got the all-weather um, form coming into mm. it, Notable Speech, and the other one being, being Night Raider. Yeah. Um, but William Buick really taught him a few things. Yeah, I, th I thought it was um, a really nice performance, and like you say, he made sure that he gave him a bit of an education, despite the fact looked really uncomplicated, hugely talented, has got speed. Um, he just looks a very decent miler. So Where is the ground with this horse? <laughs> yeah, um, th his way of going suggests low action, top of the ground, decent ground's going to suit. Mm. So you made a good point. If <laughs> the rain continues, um, early May um, is going to be a problem. Mm. But I just thought... It does dry out, you know, generally up in Newmarket. Um, but yeah, the, I think you, he's going to be very ground dependent. So will he shorten up? Probably not, because you'll have a short price favourite like City of Troy, who I hope won't blow out or, you know, mm. any, any reason to do so. Um does happen, though. We've seen that uh, in the likes of August Road down those races, and you can put in complete stinkers. He had a war front horse in it. It was like a Air mad, Force Blue. Air Force Blue, yeah. mad hot favourite in 47. Yeah. Um, um, Aiden's kind of three olds have been a little bit hit and miss as well. Mm. Um, mm. We've seen that the weekend. Yeah. Um, whereas, I don't know, if it does dry out, obviously the dips 
can obviously be a problem as well. But I, I just think, yeah, probably top of the ground. So it'll be interesting to see how they can paint this horse. But I think it's a, a good example of you talking about the tactical awareness of Kempton. I thought mm. William Buett mm. was on his A game mm. on um, Saturday. And it was Joseph O'Brien's first win in the UK this year. Obviously, he hasn't brought loads over. But I just thought he was so sharp and like with the likes of in the snowdrop, they'd gone that really steady pace and it was a very smart ride and I thought he actually made the move early, having gone very slow and she was a little bit keen. So uh, you know, she'll probably come on loads for that. And then I just saw like him give this horse an educational ride, even though he'd won, you do need to make sure they know how to battle off the bridle. So um, yeah, he was riding like a champion jockey as ever, William, and it was mm. a, a really good afternoon. But I just loved the way Notable Speech went about his job. Um, but I do think you're right. I think it's ground dependent. Yeah, it was funny. Yeah, watching it live, you kind of thought for for a couple of strides, you thought, "Oh, you're in a bit of a pocket here," yeah. and then suddenly <laughs> the yeah. race was over. It was kind of a bit similar to he, he rode Devoted Queen in the in the, in the Phillies equivalent, mm. and and she looked a bit in trouble, cut to the inside, made brilliant headway, mm. had the race run, and and then nearly got ran down by a closer at the finish. Yeah, so and that's the beauty of Kempton. Yeah. Like you can be completely in trouble, and you've got this brilliant. Um, Codway, yeah, yeah. Codway, yeah. And it, you know, sometimes they say it's not the place to be, so it can be a negative, but at least it means you can get your momentum up and get going. So it was a brilliant card, obviously. Um, I thought it was a real strong card on Saturday, so uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. The, yeah. the Racing Post years ago asked me to do a piece on like how to make money betting on Dundalk, and I was <laughs> on holiday in America at the time. And I have to say, it was one of my more half hour efforts at an article. But little did I know, the very day that my piece was coming out, they brought in the cutaway at Dundalk, right? So I didn't even know this. Oh, so no. Dundalk was a really tricky track. It was like, people forget this now. There was no cutaway. So you come into the straight. Often you were, you were locked in behind horses. And the, the day my like A to Z piece comes out, they've completely changed the configuration oh, of the track no. without really telling anyone. And... Uh, yeah, I'm not with the Racing Post anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, you touched on a few of the, of the Aidan O'Brien three-year-olds. There's a couple of performances, obviously, to, to, to mention, obviously, that the Ballysack Stakes would be the, the obvious starting point. Obviously, he didn't have the winner, had the, had the, the second and third that day, but it, it was Dallas Star that definitely sprang a surprise at 50-1. to one. Yeah, a horse that was with um, was trained in Britain, came over by Clots of Stars, who's a See the Stars horse, um, that is a cheap enough sorry, I think, based in France, but like he was sent off 50-1. to one. Maybe he didn't quite deserve to be that because the ground was so testing. I mean, it just survived uh, an inspection that morning. Um, I actually fancied Sean T later on in the card, but at that stage, Aidan had had... Both of his winners, actually, on the day were very weak in the betting battle cry and Sean T. I think Sean T's form tied in with... Um, a couple of horses who'd be disappointing. Autumn, winter. The Euphrates ran okay, but he was he sort of looked slow. Shanti was very weak in the betting, but this was a big one for Dallas. And obviously, the story is Jamie Heffernan, and was riding two winners here against um, his former boss. Um, one for Edward O'Grady, who looks an ice horse, but the, the, just the, I wouldn't be giving up on, on Illinois or the Euphrates. The Euphrates looks like he wants two miles. Frankel horse, very like he was first off the bridle, but staying going. Um, but the ground was really testing, so I'd be wary of jumping to conclusions on the Bally Sex card. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think it was their smallest field since 2018, mm. um, so it did cut up a bit. Mm. Obviously, it's a race we're always watching with interest because we're starting to get our early derby clues up and running. Um, but I think the connections seemed quite positive about Dallas Star, just a big horse that's probably quite unfurnished mm. last season, probably didn't deserve to be 50 to 1, but because I suppose of. Aiden's record in the race or the horses that have won it in the past, you know, it was he's going to have to be priced up as an outsider. So um, hopefully they got a bit of the 50 to 1 mm. that was floating around. But um, he, I thought he looks like a nice Irish derby type. Don't know where they'll go now, but I'm sure that Shamey will guide them with um, expertise. Um, and I just thought Illinois would be better over further in time and on better ground mm. as well. So yeah, it wouldn't write him off. It was kind of a yeah, story of the season so far with yeah. Ammo racing, really starting it off well mm. and, and obviously Shamie Heffern and riding freelance, riding yeah. winners left, right and centre for, for lots of different trainers. It's incredible and it's quite inspiring. Yeah. You know, he's, he's an old jockey. I'm not, there's no polite way of saying it. Yeah. You know, Obviously Frankie's just ridden a six-timer over in Santa Anita. Yeah. He's an old jockey, good for them. Um, but it's great that he's got this... What already looks like an early resurgence, and I don't know how you felt, Johnny, when the news was broke that he was going to be um, leaving Bally Doyle to go freelance. But I suppose everyone probably, you know, doubted 
the move and what was going to come of the season ahead. But you think of how much knowledge he holds. I don't know what your yeah, initial well, reaction was like, when that news Never be broke. afraid to change jobs as well. Like, you know, I think people struggle with that concept in life when they start double thinking of it and they're like, what am I giving up here, you know, and mm. is it worth the risk and all that? Shami Heffernan should have made a lot of money in his career at this stage. You know, he's ridden some very, very uh, good winners and he's probably like, I don't mind being out of the pressure cooker of Valley Doyle here. Um, I sort of got the impression that the relationship had become a little bit strained in recent years um, and it's interesting that Aidan says, you know, he's still available to me as a freelance rider, but he didn't ride for him on Sunday, whereas, you know, Interestingly, he used sort of riders attached to his son's yards, yeah. which I thought was quite because, like, Gavin Ryan, Dylan Brom, Dylan Brom McMonigal is probably considered the next big thing in Ireland, I would say. And mm. um, he rode the Euphrates. And uh, I would, if I were betting on this, I'd say the relationship might might be over. And um, I don't really see Shamey riding for Aiden again, despite the public utterances. And um, but as Haley mentioned, he's in his 50s now, Shamey. He's, he's still, a, he's still a, a brilliant judge of a horse as well, and this will be important for people who he's riding for, um, what he's able to relay in terms of the horse, regardless of winning or not, if he's riding work for you, or if he's riding, he's a brilliant judge of what that horse is capable of or not capable of. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, Aiden has had a succession of jockeys down the years who've left the, the coveted number one job in, you know, somewhat, I guess, controversial or maybe vaguely acrimonious circumstances at times. Um, it's a really, really pressurised environment, but with Shamey, I think at this stage of his career, he doesn't he doesn't need it if he doesn't if he if he weren't happy there. Yeah, no, definitely. Before we wrap up racing recap, just one last thing. Obviously, we round Aidan Coleman announced his retirement. Mm -hmm. Obviously, on Sunday, um, Hayley, I'll come to you. Obviously, fantastic rider. Obviously, didn't have that many big successes, I suppose, until recently, and, and it's a real shame that he's kind of been forced to, to bow out. Yeah, I'm gutted that he hasn't made it back. I remember one of the physios saying that he completely obliterated his knee, in you know, putting it quite bluntly, and he was going to have to work very hard, and he has put so much effort in with his rehabilitation, and unfortunately, it's just not going to be enough for him to hold the position that you need to hold as a jockey. Um, obviously, quite select um you know, you've got to be up in up in the irons riding shortish you know hopefully you can still ride a horse but not um you know be fit enough to be in the, the jockey position for long enough uh, ever again so it's really hard actually and yeah for a long time he only had grade two success which i found hard to believe so it meant the world when he finally had that grade one breakthrough and he started to be very select with you know what he was riding i felt like he was finally getting the quality he'd always yearned for but a hugely talented rider at least he had a great, he has achieved so much. Over a thousand winners, that's to be admired. Yeah. Very nice person, very intelligent rider as well. Um, and yeah, I was really sad that he's lost this battle to come back because it's tough. I still feel like he was probably at like a fine wine, getting better with age and time. And I disagree with you on this because I, 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 I would always work back from... Uh, the death of a jockey or, or, or serious injury and uh, mm. if he can get out in one piece of 35 yeah, do you know yeah, it's kind of yeah. like it, it's bad but it's like it could be so much worse and oh, it's so dangerous yeah. so you look at even when Fran Berry retired and I was actually looking at the fall that Fran had at, I think it was Wolverhampton his last ride at the weekend because I was trying to explain to a non-racing friend of mine how dangerous flat racing is and like that was a horrible horrible incident and Fran could have been so much worse so I always mm. kind of think and his brother's doing so well training now as well Kevin I think that Aiden will be fine and he'll it's it's sad but it could be worse for that. Oh yeah, sense. no, of course. Mm. You think of people like, you know, Graham Lee who've yeah. given so much to the sport that he was so successful in and you know, it's very tough for him and his family that mm. you know, he's not out in one piece. Um I work with a lot of people that haven't walked away in one piece and it's very hard. So you, yeah, you're completely right. I've I've a baby on the way now. I was thinking mm. this right. Do I want him or her to be a jockey? No. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's, mm. it's dangerous. You get the tennis racket or the golf that, That's clubs. rugby cycling <laughs> and, and jockeys rule out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and no boxing. Crack. I was watching some boxing <laughs> the other day. That doesn't look too good. you present on so. racing TV. Yeah. But I, I will, I thought it was quite interesting. Um, I've, read, I've run a few marathons, enjoyed a couple, hated a couple. The first and last ones I did, like the first one you get your pace wrong, the last one I hadn't done enough training for. Don't recommend that. Um, but my brother Jamie ran his first marathon and I was like, did you enjoy that? He's like, 
it's all right, got halfway, and he ran a really good time, just over three hours. Um, he went far too fast early and got tired. Um, and he said, yeah, the second half was, it was like quite hard work. So obviously just he hadn't another 13 paced miles. himself. Yeah, yeah just another 13.2 <laughs> to go. And he said, um, it doesn't compare to riding a winner though. Yeah. And I thought that's interesting. Cause obviously he's only just retired from racing, again, forced into retirement. And riding winners is so exciting, mm. that buzz. Mm. And unfortunately running a marathon for him didn't, um, cut the mustard so I just thought yeah it's just getting that adrenaline rush and that you know you've absolutely nailed yeah. it mm. on a race course and had a success you're not going to get that again I think it's quite hard mm. so it's going to be hard to replace yeah that, that kick yeah, yeah. Mm. a lot of n normal people will, will yeah say that running a marathon is is well, like a yeah. lifetime uh, achievement yeah, yeah. Like, no it didn't do anything for <laughs> yeah. me first ride a winner <laughs> basically yeah whereas I loved running the London Marathon but it was great fun so yeah. there we go <laughs> Right, there you go. <laughs> An interesting end to recent recap. <laughs>Before we get into our Aintree preview, just to let you know that our sponsors, Bet365, have an ITV racing price promise. They will not be beaten on price on any horse for all UK and Irish races shown live on ITV Racing. Terms and conditions can be found on the website. So, as it's a Grand National preview, there's only one race that we can really start with, and that is the Grand National itself. Obviously, we have last year's winner, Corat Rambler, head in the market, um, and then a bunch of Irish horses, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, uh, funnily enough, you know, numerically Ireland has dominated the race, but we do have uh, an English trained favourite. Um, I was saying before Cheltenham to everyone, I was like, ground descriptions that are based on one word, uh, four letter word and soft, five letter word and heavy, it doesn't cut it in terms of the rain we've had this year. <laughs> And I was saying, this Shelton will be like no other. Um, they kind of got through it maybe better than I thought. But Aintree and Haley will, will say the same thing here th with regard to Nassalam. It's so ground dependent this year. And I, I'm still, we're recording this on Tuesday. I'm still not entirely sure how we're going to get Saturday. Um, I feel it's going to be testing. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be like, I was actually worried with the meeting being going ahead um, a few days ago in terms of the rain that they've gotten. I'm, I, I do not feel that Corey Grambler wants to ground absolutely bottomless over this trip. So I think he's worth taking on. Yeah, we, were, we we had a review show afterwards with, with Don McLean, and I, I said after that, it was a hard race in the Gold Cup. It's a bit different mm -hmm. coming into it last year, winning an Ultima, kind of hacking around for a circuit and a handicap, but he, he was a tired horse at the end of it. Yeah, it, it was obviously um, tacky ground, a lot of them, like dead ground was what they were describing it, because we were a bit obviously disappointed with Nassau, yeah. and it was like, well, you know, what happened there? It's like, well, actually... The ground wasn't soft enough, yeah. but it's mm. that different type mm. of soft when there's like a whole magnitude of how mm. you can describe ground. It sounds really boring, but obviously you've got your wet ground like the, the Welsh Grand National when they're slogging through, which obviously he relished and same with the trials. And it had dried out, hadn't it, at that point. Then after the Gold Cup, it started to rain again. Mm. It started to lash it down. That probably would have helped. So um, even though it was soft, tiring ground, it wasn't what something like Nassalam was, so you're right, it was holding. So I actually thought, I played Corrit Rambler because he's probably aren't the conditions and he's run a huge race. How talented is this horse? But then how much is that going to take out of him? Because it's a you know, stiff and tough old finish and he's lined up against two very good horses in front of him. And it was a huge effort. Um, but then you think, well, he's already been there, done it. He's won the race before. Theoretically, he should be carrying top weight. And he has, on his new revised mark, got a, a few pound well in. So yeah. it's quite obvious, isn't it? You stick with the favourite, a horse that's won it before. He's very well handicapped. But, like you say, you don't know what mark that last race has left. I don't think he'd go off favourite on that ground, I think. Because, like, as much as he's theoretically well in, he's 13 pounds higher than last year on totally different ground after having a tough race in the Gold Cup. Um, but he's so talented. Yeah. He's got... Um, a lot of character, quirky, mm. and he's got so much ability. And I just think, come those big fences, showing them something to give him a bit more of an interest. Mm. And he's he's not got the games of head carriages, but he's got so much ability. I don't mm. think you'll ever get to the bottom of him. So I, then I kind of think, well, he would have maybe kept a bit in the locker from the Gold Cup. Then again, actually, no, it's the Gold Cup. Surely you <laughs> go and, and, you know, if he was good enough. But um, I'm sure they would have had a Grand National in the back of their mind. And as much as you want to... Gold Cup, and I suppose you can do the two, but he's got a lot of ability, and I don't know, I suppose at least there's been a nice gap yeah. from the Gold Cup yeah. to 
started a national this year, nearly 30 days. Yeah, mm. you talk of quirky, talented horses. Meeting of the Waters was the one that I was kind of drawn to. Mm. Obviously, the concern would be he's raced slightly keenly in the Ultima, but he's kind of like a, got a fascinating profile for this. He does, yeah. And obviously, Paul Byrne has um, a link to him, and he, he has Mr. Incredible, who I, I actually could see being back. Me meeting of the Waters... Um, like you say, Steve, I, I would just be a little bit concerned about him getting home the way he raced at Cheltenham. You know, he, he um, for me, the race went almost perfectly for him much of the way, but he, he just wasn't quite good enough. He had gone up quite a bit for, obviously, winning at Leopardstown. Um, kind of similar enough to Noble Yates when he won this race in the sense that he came here. He's very likely raced this horse. He hasn't done much racing at all over fences. Um, I would worry about him getting home, though. I really would, like you were saying there, and in, um, in terms of Cheltenham, there's an awful lot further to go here. I, I'd probably be on Mr. Incredible of the the two horses with the Paul Byrne um, sort of uh, past. Um, I, I didn't really feel meeting of the waters at any notable excuse at Cheltenham. No. If I had to pin you down for a selection, then I like Maller Mission uh, for John McConnell. Yeah, it's the yeah, it's Cork or the the Hennessy second. Um, <sighs> Probably should have won at Cheltenham last year. I think you know he. We never know, but he. I, I backed him to. Play, I think I backed him to finish in the first three, and it was like one of these. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm home for all money here, but yeah. he's. John is kind of saying I, I I'm friendly with John. He's kind of saying that he's he's slightly worried about the ground, um, but he he has very good form on bad ground, and um, he seems to stay very well. He's plenty of class. Um, I'm surprised that just looking at the odds here now today um, with Bet365 top price, six places, 16 to 1. I'm surprised he's, he's holding on to that price. He's been trained for this race all year. Um, did everything right bar win at Newbury. I think he may have lost a shoe as well that day. He's gone up seven pounds, but like he's quite likely raced his horse. I, I think he's plenty of upside. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there, there lots of different profiles coming into it, and he's yeah he's definitely mm. been trained specifically. For yeah, this. they were talking about getting like a hurdles run into him, but yeah. the ground obviously went against. And yeah, so they we didn't want to bottom him out no. in a hurdle race with a view to this, but yeah, I, he's coming here after 133 days off, but he he'll be in good nick. Um, I can definitely see him getting into a good rhythm if you're looking at a horse that'll. One of the things if you're a five reach way punter with the national is something to inspire you for 10 minutes of your life you know and I this was the one thing I've kind of lost my love for the national a bit over the years but the one thing I loved was when your horse was getting into a rhythm and you you see so many other horses struggling and you're like oh my god I have a chance here granted there's another 18 fences to go like but uh you know this fella will get into rhythm I think yeah no definitely yeah that's why you have a few goes isn't it yeah, you've, got, yeah. you've got to cover all bases <laughs> I normally like to attack the race with at least four yeah. chances because you do get the 100 to 1 winners, a 60 to 1, 66 to 1 uh, shots come up with the goods. So, um, I was at Utox to Midlands National Day, really fun days racing, actually, and there's some brilliant prize money, talking of prize money mm. on that Bet365 had put up that day. And Mr. Incredible rocks up, so I was right straight to the paddock to see how this horse looked, you know, because he had a massive weight, really testing ground. I, I thought the meeting actually might be abandoned, it was one of those, um, but went ahead. For him to come back from that time off, that weight he carried to put in that performance behind Beauport, mm. I was really impressed. And I know Carl Wenner had been heavily involved with Beauport, funny at the Corby Air Colours that actually mm. won the National, winning the Midlands National. Um, and I thought it was a great run from Mr Incredible. Obviously, there's a bit of question mark whether or not he'll jump off, but apparently that is that he's actually fine. It's not a, it's not a thing. So um, they've been practising it at home and everything's yeah. okay. And... I think the invested interest that Patrick Mullins put in this horse, um, I'm just starting to think, you know, has he got a really nice weight? An eight-year-old, 10-10. Um, you know, Seems to be going to ride in the race last year. Yeah, time, that's yeah. it. Yeah, and, and we know that he can he can take to the fences. So he's one that's gone on to my shortlist. I thought he looked... I love looking at horses in the parade ring. I thought he looked straight enough, but equally would tighten up, which yeah. any horse I think had been off for a long, long time, like, over, like nearly a, a year or so. Um, and I think he'll, yeah, definitely have you know, needed that run. He needed to complete, obviously, to qualify. Um, so there was a lot relying on that race for him to take his you know, place in the Nationals. So um, he's gone onto the shortlist with quite a few others. <laughs> yeah, Paul Byrne is interesting because like this horse wouldn't have been the most obvious horse for him to procure out of, wasn't it? Henry had him and he sort of started pulling himself up. Um, Paul works back from winning the Grand National Prize, you know, and winning, Paul looks at prize money and what can I do? Will I be able to sell this horse? And uh, 
I think this horse could be backed on the day. I do. Yeah. I think, like Haley says, a lot of positives about him, and he se seems to have sort of sorted his head out. I wonder though if um, you should make the most of the, the price now. Mm. He's got a cool name, so mm. a lot of yeah. people just be like, you know, young kids who are obviously just you know, having sweets with their betting, mm. um, <laughs> who might <laughs> want to have a horse to follow, like Mister Incredible. He sounds like a superhero, so yeah. even for that, he might shorten well, up. Well, he, so. he was saying the race last year, right? He was fourteen to one in a thirty-nine runner national with Corey Grambler in it, right? I, I genuinely don't think there's a horse that, that, that is that well handicapped this year. And he was going well when he unseated. So five pounds higher, lots of positives and trained for the race. Yeah, yeah. Um, Benilia was a horse that mm. I backed last year. Got very excited. Just thought he had a really interesting profile. Massive fan of Gavin Cromwell regardless. I always mm. look at his horses yeah. very closely. Um, is starting to get a bit short, <laughs> not the same value. Worried about the ground as well. I was yeah, talking today, yeah. Um, so that might be a, a bit of an issue. But he went on to my shortlist as well. Um, and then Limerick Lace, another naturally drawn to Gavin Cromwell. I thought that um, she comes into it in really good form. And there were some slightly bigger prices um, of horses that I don't know. I just wonder if. Venetia Williams is going to hold the key. She's obviously had a 100 to 1 winner in the past, and Shambard's in there at 66 to 1. Um, I just wondered if the day, if the ground is going to be soft. I thought, you know, I'm, I am really interested in that, um, looking at anything that's run in the Ultima. Mm. I think that's a great pathway in, which we've been mm. seeing with Corrett Rambler. And obviously, there's a few like Meeting with the Waters who have to reverse the form. But I just thought he didn't have a clear out clear run round, there was a few things that went wrong and um, he was just given a really patient ride. I thought he was going to creep into it uh, under Lucy Turner. I just thought that he looked a massive price. So um, I think Mon Moan won it at 100, 100 to, to 1. one. Yeah. So I thought it might be a bit of value. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, nice for Lucy Turner as well. We've got a really good affiliation with the horse as yeah. well. So yeah, you'd imagine yeah. would keep the ride. And obviously has got the winning form over the national fences. Yeah. So there was... Um, you know, a lot of boxes ticked five pound higher than than when absolutely annihilating Coco Beach earlier on this season. Yeah. So, I just thought that was a, a promising enough run from him. At, at, um, he is old. That's the thing. He's a yeah. twelve year old. So that'd be the the real negative if you're a, a trends backer. Coco Beach that as well did everything mm. right and still no no answer. And Coco Beach is form ties in with Limerick Lace. He beat her in the Troy Town at Navan. And um, when she was really well back, so I, I, but Haley mentions her, she's a sister to, I know the way you're thinking. So the siblings won in the space of sort of 24 hours yeah. of Cheltenham, probably never been done before at the festival. But um, you've you got to say maybe she won't stay, but she has lots of class. Like that performance in Navin will relish the ground. She was r r running off 141, which is pretty much the same as the mark she has here, if you want to compute. Um, and she did all bar beat Coco Beach. Um, and I, she has a lot of upside at a low weight. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. definitely. A few to uh, a few to put on your shortlist then for for the Grand National. If we haven't found the winner there, mentioning what ten, eleven horses. <laughs> I better mention Nasalan. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be, <laughs> my name will be mud. Um, I think he's very badly handicapped. Yeah. I think my dad's made that quite clear. <laughs> um, lots of positives though. He ran well and stayed on on his first go over the national fences. Uh, Caelan Quinn was on board in that day. Jumped round really well. Obviously, the trip was too short. Stayed on nicely. Then went to the um, Nash, uh, Welsh National Trial. Headgear went on just to make him concentrate. And whether you know that was the turning point and him obviously getting extreme conditions, him strengthening up. He came away from a, a summer's break looking the best he's ever looked. Um, Funny enough, by um, Alex Embirikos, whose mother and father obviously had Aldeniti, so he's actually had a little spell in Aldeniti's stable, so nice. I'm hoping that the stars will align. <laughs> if it absolutely lashes it down and it is heavy ground, well, the handicappers handicapped him for those conditions because yeah. he's not a 161-rated horse, and the fact that he's got two pounds more than last year's Grand National winner, I think, is horrifying. So he's badly handicapped, but he is an extreme conditions horse. So um, there's heavy in places at the moment on the track. Um, you know, there are some really testing parts. Hopefully the rest of it will match up. It's soft at the moment, but if we can get heavy ground all round, then I'd love to see him at least run top six. Um, you know, because we know that he'll excel in those conditions when so many are going to be hindered. So but he'll need, he'll need it to be 
nearly unraceable. So, but don't worry, it will be fine. Brian Hamilton, I say, he's a former trainer, but he's clerk of the course at Down Patrick now, which was called off on Sunday. But he said on Friday or Saturday, he said, the ground is unraceable in most parts. Where it is raceable, the ground is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Just need to throw that in there. Like, you know, yeah. It's unraceable or heavy. Um, but hopefully it'll be a mixture of that for Nassalam. you got to yeah. wonder if he didn't get the... 16 pounds and he creeps in off, off his lower mark yeah you know but it, it is what it, I, I in fairness to the handicapper it's very very hard to handicap a 34 length winner of a race like yeah. that when clearly you can't be taking this at face value no, like, do you exactly. know what i mean so yeah, it's difficult yeah yes. yeah anyway Sorry. we'll mm. always be against the handicapper mm. so. you'll, you'll be one of 10 still being outside doing the rain dance hoping yeah, that yeah, it's still yeah, raining exactly. this week exactly yeah yeah i was complaining getting into london to <laughs> grab a coat to come over mm. to the studio but actually i was like no can't complain can't complain I said to johnny when i got here no it's fine just <laughs> accept it awful weather at the moment keep going <laughs> Uh, we'll then go back in time to the Thursday. We've obviously just had declarations come through. Uh, the Manifesto Novices Chase will be the first race of the festival. Uh, obviously, grade one over two and a half miles. Uh, we have five declared with Grey Dawn in Ginny's Destiny, Illate Tom, Blow Your Ward, and Colonel Harry. Uh, Johnny, I'll come to you, particularly around Illate Tom. Uh, back, going back up in trip. Going back up in trip, yeah. Um, I, maybe Gaelic Warrior is very, very good. I, I was I, I never really. A mad Ilete Tom fan in the sense of, you know, I thought the arc was disappointing that this horse was such a short price because he beat Found a 50 at Leverett Sam, but Found a 50 probably needs to go the other way and Gaelic Warrior destroyed him at Limerick. Um, but Grey Dawning, as we spoke pre-show, wasn't supposed to be running in this race. They're talking of stepping him up in trip, um, but he renews rivalry, obviously. Uh, with um, I remember it was a weird feeling watching this race on the Thursday at Cheltenham because it's like, are there ever going to be a British winner at Cheltenham again? And thankfully on that, that Thursday... They started to bang in some winners, and I really liked his performance. Um, I, I feel he should he should confirm um, form over Ginny's Destiny, and Dan Skelton obviously has made the choice based on the ground to run here, and he's just very uncomplicated. Um, it, we're just looking at his price here now. He's evens a bet cheeks yeah. He might get a bit better than that on the day, but uh, I, I, I don't see any reason to oppose this horse. No. You'd probably say, Hayley, that Ginny's Destiny, Cheltenham is his track. And if yeah. Grey Dawning could beat him at Cheltenham, he'll probably confirm for my injury. Yeah, at the moment their standings are a two one. Mm. So um we've we've seen plenty of them like going head to head, which is great. Uh I'm intrigued to see Ginny's Destiny back at Aintree. He has had one run there in a maiden back when he used to be with Tom Lacey and um, ran all right there as well. Um so it'll be intriguing to see how he's gonna actually translate his form away. I'm a, a massive fan of his. Like for him to have improved twenty pounds, a mark of one three five, they obviously had his first run for Paul probably needed it. Yeah. And then to go up to a mark of one five five, that's you know, obviously a horse that's thrived in the company of, of Paul Nichols being down at Ditchit. I I suppose I thought he'd get the better of Grey Dawning, but this is a horse they've held in very high regard. I think they're thinking like Gold Cup mm -hmm. long term with him and it's gonna be an interesting head to head once again, but I don't know, I feel very much as though I might just stick with Ginny's Destiny because I do feel like even though Grey Dawning needs further, Ginny's Destiny I think will be even better over further as well. So I just thought at the prices, I'm not going to give up with Ginny's Destiny because I still think he's progressing. And as long as he's taken his last race okay, I think he is tough and hardy. So might just stick with him. I think I've just fallen in love with him a little bit because of how he's just improved all yeah. season. So I think I'm a little bit caught up with him. But it'll be really intriguing to see with the the, the jump, uh, the jumpers, um, the championship, the trainers' yeah. championship mm. is. Uh, you've got all three of them in there: Paul, Dan, and and Willie. So yeah. um, obviously it's going to probably come down to the Grand National itself. But great little sideline. Absolutely. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Great storyline to go yeah. through for the three days. Ginny's Destiny, yeah, currently available at 9 to 4 with Bet365 first show after Dex. Uh, next race that we'll have a look at will be the Aintree Bowl. Um, a really competitive lineup. Johnny, I'm going to come to you first again because Corbett's Cross, a little bit of a surprise entry in here. Obviously, Novice taking on. Taking yeah, on. It's, it's, I guess it's M. Mullins. You know, he doesn't mind doing this. Uh, did it last year with uh, Farinelli taking on older horses and he. He swims against the tide. Um, I do, do, do we say Jerry Colombe, he, he did have a tough race at Cheltenham. I, I actually felt that the one horse that I was taking out of the Gold Cup that I wouldn't be back in the next day is Gallop and Deschamps. I thought he had a really tough race 
even though people would say he won readily, like he had, to, it's such a grueling race and he's had a tough season. Jerry Colomb hasn't really, you know, he was very, very fresh at Cheltenham. I thought it was an exemplary performance. He really justified the trainer's belief in him, bolted up at the festival last year. Um, I, I, I'm not, not sure what to make of Corbett's Cross. I know he won very well against MC Gardens, but that was a funny sort of a race. This is way, way tougher. And that, obviously the dark one here is Shishkin won the race last year and like, in looking at Sergino in the previous race, I just want to see a little bit more about the Henderson horses mm. just to see. Um, Sergino should win, but I'm just, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he did blow out a little bit. Um, so I, I, I find it very hard to oppose Jerry Colomb. Yeah, with regards to Nick Hens, yeah, he's had a couple of couple of winners and then a, mm. a few obviously yeah. blow out as well. Mm. So it is, it is going to be interesting. You, you obviously got Aintree form from from last season coming into this. Jerry Colomb obviously was a winner of the Novice Chase. Yeah. Shiskin won the race last year. Obviously, a Hoyt and Euro and Brave Man's game have had plenty of battles at Aintree at this spring festival over hurdles and fences. I think it's a cracking race. Yeah. Really good race. Um, even would you ignore a Hoyt and Euro? Mm. No, probably. I've probably been way too many times this season. <laughs> um, but I'll mention for some of the others then. Great Brave Man's game's going to have cheap pieces on. Paul Nichols' record in the race is won it four times the last 10 years. So he obviously knows which one to bring. Didn't get the ground though at Cheltenham. And Probably won't, won't get it here right. either from looking at the forecast. Um, he does tend to run better fresh, so that you're really relying heavily on the cheap pieces to make a difference. Corbett's Cross, he's got the hood left on. I see that they've declared in that. I thought mm. that was interesting because obviously I think it's a positive that it's shorter than last time, still um, further than the other option that he could have gone for, but. Um, at least it's not as far as the, the grade two amateur race. So that's a positive because he can be a bit keen. But I thought it was a really good run at Cheltenham off the back of a fall to come out and win that way. Um, Mark Walsh for the ever shrewd Emmett Mullins. I think it's probably the right race for him. But I mean, obviously the exciting thing is it's open company. So that's another, um, he's got to prove himself. And then Shishkin won the race last year and my word, what a season he's had, obviously refusing to race. And he looked like he was going to go and win at Kempton, yeah. unseating what was a bit of a freak accident. And then we finally saw him win the, the, the Denman, but I've had his season down as turbulent. Um, I find it hard to give up on him, but we, I think we're going to have a really good clash. I don't know what price he is, Shishkin, but yeah, I'd imagine he'd be trees. quite prominent yeah, in the trees. betting. Yeah. So he'll, he'll be all right in the conditions if it yeah. is soft as well. Um, and I even thought Thunder Rock, I thought he would, um, the, the way Ollie Murphy's stable have finished off, it, you know, this all's got back on track at Kelso. And just going back to that Marla Mission form um, mm. back at Carlisle in the mm. first season, obviously Marla yeah. Mission ran a huge race, like you say, at Newbury. So I'll be watching to see how um, this all goes for his chance later on in the week. But it's a really, really competitive renewal, um, a lot of ifs and buts. So... I think if there's anything you like, just get stuck in, really. Don't be too taken with the favourite. Jerry Colomb's a horse I just think just relentlessly gallops and stays. I don't know, he's a horse I haven't really taken to, but he ran a great race at Cheltenham. So um, I suppose I'm not one of them that's sold by him because I always feel as though he always sort of just does enough, but there's nothing wrong with him. Like He's got a good attitude, likes it like you say over course and distance. So... It's really competitive. I suppose I'm mostly intrigued by um, Corbett's cross, but maybe I'll stick with Shishkin because I'm not going to give up on him. He's like proven he's still got his ability from Newbury. Yeah, and his price is going to be reflected in what Sir Gino yeah. does in the race before. Obviously, yeah. we haven't got time to, to, to go through every single race. We'll kind of recap it at the end. But yeah, I think if, if Sir Gino blow, blows out, you'll, you'll get a much bigger sure, price. Sure, yeah, that's a really good afterwards. point. Gutted not to have seen that horse in the trial. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, we'll then move on to the, the other grade one of the day, the, the Aintree Hurdle. Um, Ireland looks set to dominate. You've got Bob Ollinger at an Impero Pass towards the head of the market. But, yeah, but both chased home state man last time. Who would you be uh, Yeah, down on? I'd be sweet on, on, on Impero Pass here, Steve. Um, just the last day when, as you mentioned, he was behind um, Bob Ollinger, they, they changed tactics to make the running. It never looked it. like it suited him at all. It. Um, now, in fairness, like this was the the whole thing about the time before that was, oh, um, why would you ride him against Stateman um, over two miles the way they did? Why not make it a test? It just didn't work out at all. But remember how brilliant he was at Cheltenham last year when he beat Gaelic Warrior, um, and I thought his performance prior to that when he was second to Stateman, when he I wouldn't say he got him off the bride at left sound, but he did very little wrong. And as much as you're saying, I'm I'm fancying a horse here who's been beaten three times on the bounce now. 
often at short prices. That run behind Tiopu is there's nothing wrong with that form, you know, and it was still it was maybe a little bit fresh on the day. Um I'm I, I actually this is one race that have a strong view in Bet365, even money Bob Ollinger, um nine to four um in Perry Passe, there is no way they'll go off that far apart. In fact, I wouldn't even be certain Bob Ollinger goes off favourite. Still a horse I have some reservations about, um, but in Perry Passe, part of as you mentioned that Willie Mullins uh, title bid, um he is an important one here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Heidi, your thoughts? Um, I'm intrigued to see what Langer Dan does in graded company of a ten pound rise, a handicap. Having so left Cheltenham, having left yeah. Cheltenham, yeah, done his job there. Yeah. Back to his last winning mark at the festival. Um, yeah, it's, it'll be intriguing to see how he shapes in this kind of grade. Uh, I'm not going to stick with him though because it's too much of an unknown. Um, we've got the eight, hopefully. So Lucia, she was the go-to girl for the Nikki Henderson team behind State Man. And she lined up in the champion hurdle on ground supposedly she didn't like. And she ran a great race. So I think that getting a bit of um, weight for sex allowance, I thought she was worth another each way go. She She's done really well this season. Ground or the trip would be a worry yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah, that would be the, the question mark mm. beside her. Um, but I suppose I think the realistically the Irish have got the hold on this. Um, the meal line loves a bit of cut in the ground. Saw him... Win a nice grade two earlier on this season in Canton for Kerry Lee. Um, but yeah, I think probably being realistic, Bob's going to be the one. Bob Ollinger, when they clashed behind Statement, this is he was sent off 11 to 1 and in Perry Pass he was 100 to 30, right? So either the market was completely wrong that day or the market is wrong now, and I feel it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we'll then move on to Friday. We've got the Mild Maiden Officers Chase. Um, all change at the. Uh, in in the betting for this, mm. obviously with Corbett's Cross and, and Grey Dawn both declared, obviously on the first day, um, you've now got. I know the way you're thinking. Head in the market. Um, I mean, the handicapper is, is rated him 158, which Nearly is the same as, as Nassalan, which yeah. <laughs> which is the same as Grey Dawn in a pound ahead of Corbett's Cross. So the handicapper was definitely uh, impressed with the Kim Muir win. Do, do you think stepping into to Grey Dawn Company, do, do you give him a chance? Yeah, like, uh, I think the word at Cheltenham was, you know, if Gavin Cromwell apparently had said, if I have a Gold Cup horse for the future, this is him. Um, the race at Cheltenham was extraordinary, though, because he sort of jumped a little bit right at the first, but he's quite careful at his fences, funny mm-hmm. enough. So if he can iron that out, I, I, I couldn't believe. First of all, he was sent off 13 days in a 22-runner handicap. Um, it was crazy stuff, but I, I, you know, he's six years of age. He just seems to have so much ability, this horse. Um, as I say, these walk in the parks, if they, if they do stay these trips, a lot of them just have an awful lot of class. And um, I, I'm, I was a little bit disappointed in Oroco at Cheltenham. I don't know what Haley thought. I, I, I mean, maybe he ran his race, but he never really looked like winning. Um, and I, I do like uh, another you're thinking. I spoke to Gavin. He will run in this race. Um, I don't see any negatives, really. I yeah. thought Oroco just had a tough task off mm. the back of... One run or whatever. Yeah, mm. I think maybe they were just uh, probably could have done with getting him out. It was mm. like 128 days off mm. and he was making a return at Cheltenham. I think you've got to be very talented. So th- the way I know you're thinking, one, that was so impressive. that he, But he'd been very highly tried against some good horses. Mm. Um, remember highly tried is one way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then obviously the last day, I think he had a bit of trouble in running and was nursed home at Leopardstown. Um, you know, and then obviously well backed heading to Cheltenham. And uh, it was a wonderful Cheltenham for... Derek O'Connor on the whole, yeah. mm. so he, I think he's going to be an exciting horse and ready to get a bit another big day in the sun. I think the Gallic Warrior form is pretty strong with him. Yeah, so. uh, I'd give a shout to to Keontae Classico in this. I, I was impressed mm. with his Ultima win. Um, Holy Well won the Ultima as a novice and then came on to win this. So mm. there has been previous. Um, yeah. On horses coming coming that route, but, absolutely. But he's um he's a bit shorter than I, that I'd want. He's now hundred to thirty. I, I it's kind the best of want price. It. Yeah, I suppose I, that's I, the ground for mm, him. Yeah, like, real positive. Um, he's I mean he's had an amazing season on the whole. On the whole, he's won at all the right places as well for his connections. So Francis Brook is heavily involved. Um, the King's representative at Royal As- at Ascot Racecourse. I I actually so, met him at. at Mallow was it last season? Yeah, was, mm. he, Fuzzy Stack had a winner for him, I think. Yeah, at a big price. Yeah, nice guy. So he, um, you know, this is a horse that obviously won at Ascot now at Cheltenham, and you know he's looked incredibly talented. Um, and it's just David Bass and Kim Bailey. I think that was had to be one of the most popular winners at the Cheltenham yeah. Festival. 
um, and obviously all their connections. But I just wonder if he's going to find this a, a little bit too yeah. too tough. But then he'll have his conditions with the yeah. current going description. So, you know, he's got a, a wonderful way of going with his jumping. Um, I think he'll find this a lot easier jumping around Aintree than what he has at Cheltenham and Ascot this season. I think Aintree is such a lovely flat track and he's a, he's a lovely big horse that I'm excited to see him um, back back at a nice level track again. Unfortunately, phlegmatic. They're going to put a statue of him at Kempton <laughs> one day. He just couldn't get the better of him. No. It's like it's his, his race horse, that horse. So, yeah, but otherwise he's had a wonderful season and um, I'm sure he'll run another good race for them. Yeah, you could have Corto Star at one end and yeah. Pragmatic at the other <laughs> looking at each other. The, uh, <laughs> the, the regular race go is Punter's friend, I think he is. Definitely. Yeah, great horse. Uh, and then a quick shout out for, for Broadway Boy. Obviously, it was sad news for the Twiston Davis that he obviously yeah. c couldn't run at the Cheltenham Festival. Uh, it's kind of been our, our show horse for the for the whole season, so it'd be great to see him run a good race. He'll, he'll definitely make it a, a test of stamina. He's kind of got one way of going, and Sam yeah, it's a proper test. It, it, like this is the second day. It, it could be really testing yeah. ground here. Like you know, I don't underestimate that. I mean, obviously the fact that uh, he didn't run at Cheltenham is a bonus as well for some horses coming here fresh. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we then move on to the top novices hurdle. Um, this is an absolute belter looking at the entries. Obviously hard to know exactly what's going to run at this stage, but you've got the likes of Mystical Power, Slade Steel, Firefox, Dysol Enos, Brighter Days Ahead. It's, yeah, it's, it's a great race. Ama amazing race on paper. Um, Steve, you know, I, I, it's, it's really hard to, to kind of uh, put up something at the moment without yeah. without knowing. But um, ju just in relation to Firefox, I, just looking back at the race again today, he did run actually very well in the Supreme. Like he was, mm. he was he unlucky. probably didn't quite have the tactical speed to get into position that Jack Kennedy wants him to get in come the second last, but um, the, 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 the kind of interference that he met. But Mystical Power was the one to take out the race. For me, it was just, I'm sure he wants better ground than he mm. had at Cheltenham. This is my concern for this race in that will they risk him if it's um, heavy and if it's similar enough ground. Slade Steel was so strong up the hill relative to mystical power I think he'll probably beat him again but I, I have to wait to see what runs here I was very disappointed to see Dice Artinos miss um, the mayor's race I was mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing her yeah yeah we've obviously got the Mersey novices to hurdle obviously on the Saturday as well over two and a half so it, yeah a lot have multiple entries yeah that takes your eye on um, well I suppose be the return of Caldwell Potter yeah. so far that um, is it the dispersal cell you yeah. call it um, he, he didn't run at Cheltenham because he had to acclimatise I was like yeah remind me of the story like my my, my ex-girlfriend was like in a, in a school one day and there was a quirky teacher and it was a Monday and they said oh she's not coming in today she's jet lagged I was like where, she, where was she flying from London I was like how do you have to acclimatise you're going from like Gordon Elliott to Paul Nichols like yeah. but he's so he's like, we're not going to run him with Cheltenham. He has to acclimatise. He's like, Paul, you're just running away from Cheltenham yeah. now with your good horses. But he, interestingly, he said he do, he's not a morning glory horse. But he's not like that flashy. No, yeah. I, he's not even that flashy to look at. Mm. Um, I remember I, I hadn't seen him in 740 the grand, please. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I went down to um, see Paul ahead of the Cheltenham Festival to discuss his runners. And uh, I was like, oh, I can have a quick look at him. Obviously, he wasn't on the list because it was mm. quite clear that they weren't running yeah. at Cheltenham. And I had a look at him and I thought, oh, gosh, not much to look at at all. Quite a small grey wow. horse. And, mm. um, you know, for a six-year-old, I don't know, he just didn't look, doesn't doesn't take the eye at all. But my word, he's had a wonderful career. Um, but for Gordon Elliott. So I, see, mm. I do understand what they mean, that you get a lot of French horses that take a bit of time to acclimatise. But... Um, Gordon does train with a hill, and Paul does train. He's putting around gallop. Like okay. neither of them have missed a trip with making sure they've got the top facilities. Obviously, Paul's famous for his steep hill and trying to get a horse to go up that three times. They get fit. Um, whereas someone like Willie Mullins only trains on the flat. Quite similar to the French way of training horses. Very deep. Um, very deep. Very deep yeah. yeah. I just find it interesting. What does your dad do? Uh, we've got both. We've got a round. Yeah. Paul Nichols has a round. You know, so he actually didn't have a round, but then because everyone else got a round, Paul put yeah. a round in. We've got a round. You know, you just follow what's. Yeah. You know, everyone obviously in followed fashion, what um, Martin Pipe did mm. many years ago, and you keep changing all the time. Mm. So, uh, Gordon does have a hill. Paul's hill's outstanding. So uh, it is a different feed and different. I, I, I do respect like they've given him time and. So far, all the horses that have run from that sale have been pretty average, haven't mm -hmm. they, with other connections. So maybe they'll be well rewarded. Um, and his forms, obviously, to go from, was it Maiden Company straight mm. into a 
a grade one. That's why he's got that price tag because he's proven at the top level. And the family as well. Yeah. yeah. So he's exciting. So if we do see him, yeah. I'll watch with interest. Yeah. Don't know if I'll be jumping on <laughs> yeah. with them, betting on him. But. Yeah, I'd say he's probably more likely to run over the two and a half on, mm. yeah. on Saturday. Yeah, definitely. Rather yeah. Than definitely yeah. Yeah. Um, one that we've got quite a good idea of, of who will be running it is in the Melling chase. Um, you've got John Bond obviously stepping up in trip. You've got mm. last year's winner, Pick Dory. You've got Protector Rat, who is absolutely brilliant, I thought, in the Ryanair beating Envoy LN, who's yeah. heading here. I think it's probably worth noting, you, you've got really good festival. You've got Henry de Bromhead and, and Gordon Elliott seem to be well represented at here, uh, kind of avoiding Willie Mullins at uh, Punch Us Down later on in the season. And then you've got the, the Paul Nichols against Dan, Dan Skelton and then Nicky Henderson, who majority of horses missed Cheltenham. So I, I do think this meeting's going to be brilliant. You, yeah. you have a few angles as well, like Paul Townend has a gap to actually make up on um, Jack Kennedy, yeah. which I feel he probably will, but Willie Mullins obviously has to support his stable rider in the sense of winning the champion uh, jockey title. Um, but at the same, And Paul Townend was actually down to ride for outside trainers and that we meeting at Wexford Friday, which I was supposed to be, I was called off, but that was very unusual for him. He's mm. riding for outside stables. Whilst at the same time, Willie probably does want to win the British trainer title. Mm. He hasn't like gone you know, hammer and tongs at it, but he's in with a realistic chance. So there's a lot to take in here, and some of these horses will run at Punchdown as well. Um, I'm really intrigued to see John Bond step up and trip. You know, There's no, no real reason to say it's not going to work out for him. Um, he's obviously had a bit of a kind of an up-and-down campaign, but I'd love to see him run here. I do want to see what form the yard is in go, going into this, but pick mm. Dory for me is bulletproof I just I you know even at the price he's at today now 130 pounds like each way he's been absolutely trained for the race again and um, brilliant the last day maybe long press he wasn't quite his best but I, I have no reason to oppose this horse at the prices yeah absolutely fantastic in the race last year as well mm. Hayley your thoughts um protector app is going to be my selection yeah. I loved his performance I thought that Empoir Allen um, was going to be on for another um Cheltenham success another Ryanair but didn't work out at all and the way this horse finished off I thought it was a really lovely performance so if we get to see him I thought um, provided he's come out of that that grade one okay the way he won the race I'd say that um, of course he's had a hard race he's, he's won a grade one but he, he looked like he was very comfortable in doing so yeah, yeah. definitely uh, we then skipped a one race on the Saturday uh, the Liverpool hurdle the uh, grade one over three miles. Johnny, you, have you got a steer on whether Tiapu does come over? I, sadly, I don't. Um, and obviously, see, we've the issue with um, Irish Point as well, who for me is a fascinating horse because like, he stayed the three miles conclusively, albeit in a muddling race at Leopardstown, and then was able to drop back and run as well as he did. And like one of the last horses off the bridle at Cheltenham, to be fair, mm -hmm. really versatile ground wise. But he's had, I mean, Irish Point had options this week. I'm not sure he's going to want the ground. Um, I, I I don't really see the two of them running, if, if that makes sense. Florin Porter will run. Spoke to Gavin Cromwell yeah. this morning. Um, but Tiopu, I, I, for me, uh, this was his day of deliverance at Cheltenham. You know, he just there was so much mark of confidence behind him. Um, expertly trained for the race off his run um, at at Fairy House, and for me, it was a really commanding performance. It was a, it was a performance of a horse that is going to be a really really good three mile. Um, hurdler uh, and will basically be the top dog for all that I'm still intrigued as to what Irish Point might do over uh, three miles on good ground I don't think they're going to run both no. and sadly to say I don't really have a steer I, I, and I'd imagine Gordon is waiting like Gary Moore and everyone else to see what the ground will be like later in the week um, for these horses but Tiopu um, just looking at his price here now he's actually available at 15 to 8 right. if, if, if I were confident he'd run that's an unbelievable price like because he's he, he will. I, I can't see how he doesn't confirm the form with the horses that he beats at Cheltenham. He hasn't had a bad year. Um, he hasn't had a hard year. Loves the ground. Very straightforward stair with speed. Um, but I'm just not sure what's going to run. No, I, I think the majority of those stairs hurdle horses are, are intending to run. The floor mm. Porter, mm. Crambo, uh, Buddy One. Uh, Hewick obviously hasn't been declared for the, for, mm. for the bowl. Obviously, they might wait for, for better ground if they come back yeah. to Hurdling, which would be fascinating. Mm. The one that I actually put up on my odds checker column was Sire de Burley. I was thought yeah. two-time yeah. winner of the race. Yeah. And I actually thought the Stairs Hurdle worked against him. I thought Keith Donahue was brilliant on, mm. on floor and Porter, slowed it down, mm. as he has done for the past few years. And yeah. he just got a bit flat-footed and then stayed um, remarkably well up the hill. And yeah. I just thought a bit of a, a stronger pace in this race that he's not obviously going to be guaranteed. 
But if Botox Hass is in there, at least he'll he'll kind of make it a bit yeah, of a Yeah, um, he's going to go. We had a, um, a race course gallop uh, last week just to sort of get him back on track. Obviously, he's had a nice little break. Yeah. And the flat track, uh, I think, is key for him. Oh. That's a positive and, and soft ground. So, yeah, I wouldn't put anyone off at an each way price at all. He seems really well in himself. I think they're very happy with how he went. And um, obviously, it's going to be a big day for um, Caelan Quinn, who's just come back from injury just Where in time. Where is Caelan from, so actually? He is from um, the north. I can't remember. Right. I've spoken enough about it where he's mm. from. <laughs> <laughs> Always annoying him, asking you lots of questions, but I can't remember exactly. Good Not prospect. far from Down Royal, he right. said. Yeah. Good prospect. So, uh, he's a very oh, he's talented yeah. rider, mm. yeah. I actually think he would have been champion conditional if he hadn't had that unfortunate collar bone mm. break the last month um i think he would have if you look at his stats i know patrick wadger's probably got that sewn up now um he's had actually less rides riding at a good strike rate and um i think i'm just a bit gutted that it, that injury happened when it did because i think he would have potentially been champion conditioner. what's your dad like to ride for um really horrible right. there yeah. we go that's that keeps you, why do you think ryan's so good like, <laughs> keep, like so like hard on people like yeah and yeah, he's good i think um, tough Kaylin, love Kaylin gets a lot of help from um, jamie and josh so uh, yeah he's had a fine season remarkable rider and not got long to go until his claim's gone so yeah big opportunity for him so I, I still think, yeah, Tia Poo looks a yeah. great price if he's going to line yeah. up here. Hanging with the Moors would be a good like Netflix series or something. Like, you know, just getting We're really boring. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. It always makes me laugh whenever Gary's interviewed. It's always like in the kitchen and there's so much going on around him. Yes. And I kind of yeah. think, wow, how do you do it? <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of attention with a Grand National runner. Our first Grand National runner, of course, was Nassalam. Yeah. And I'm sort of like, oh, I'll just lock the doors and just take the phone <laughs> off the hook for a minute because um, yeah there's so much going on all the time Class. so um people like we've had uh, the jockey club coming and so sort of getting to know the horses and stuff and they were like oh, we were really undisturbed i think yeah because i've made sure that we've barricaded <laughs> the doors because it's chaos otherwise so yeah nice nice there's never a dull moment anyway Definitely not. Uh, I'll just quickly throw to, to, to both of you for anything else over the meeting. Obviously, we haven't touched on all the races. You've got, obviously, the juvenile hurdle. You've got handicaps like the, the Topham and the, and the Red Run. Is there any, Hayley, I'll come to you first. Is there anything else that you're kind of keep, keep, keeping your eye on? No, I suppose we've probably covered um, most of them. I, I'm a massive Ginny's Destiny fan. Um, he's a horse that I think's made some rapid progress. I was gutted he got beat at the Cheltenham Festival, but I'm not going to give up on him um, I'm just hoping that he'll be able to enjoy being back at Aintree it was a long time ago when he ran in a, a maiden hurdle and I'm hoping he's going to reverse that form with Grey Dawning perfect John anything else that we haven't touched on yet just one race to mention there it's uh, it's the uh, two mile handicap on the Thursday the Close Brothers Red Rum Handicap Chase and um, Pat Darrow is going to run in this and um, at, at his prices here today he's 11 to bet three five so you will get maybe a little bit better on the day but he will run he's rocking up two pounds higher than very very solid run behind Unexpected Party um, at Cheltenham but keep an eye out for Whiskey Wealth for John Shinnick and Terence O'Brien and um, I love the story of a young jockey who people don't really know about rocks up Terence O'Brien like you know takes him on really rates him lovely kids claim seven he's doing very well bolted up the last day beat Mount Frisco at Gorn and if the ground is really testing this horse won't be easily passed and he hasn't been badly treated by the British handicapper. Okie doke. Right. I will uh, put to the end that preview and then we'll come back to all three of us for a best bet of the Aintree Festival. But before we get into our best bets of the weekend just a little over free to play six horses challenge. It's available every weekend with prize pools available for five and four correct predictions as well as a jackpot for all six, and there's terms and conditions do apply. So, Johnny, you have one bet for the whole of the Aintree Festival. Who will it be? At the prices, um, I'm just looking at what time we're running here, in Perry Passe to uh, reverse form with... Uh, with Bob Ollinger and Imperi Passe is running in the 3.30 on the Thursday uh, and at the price at the moment it's 9 to 4 versus evens I'd be amazed if something like that come the off uh, they're going to ride him differently I feel this time don't forget how good he is this horse yeah Imperi Passe then for Johnny Hayley your best bet um, I'm going to 
stick with um, seeing hopefully Cuthbert Dibble line up on the Saturday. Um, he was a horse that had high expectations for um, at, at Cheltenham. Unfortunately, Mon Morale uh, really appreciated having headgear put on for the first time. So I'm hoping that um, Nigel Twist and Davies' horse will um, get back on track. His horses are, are running well continually at the moment. And um, I thought his heavy ground form up at Haydock, flat track, um, that's the bit that stands out for me. So I just think coming to Aintree, it looks like it's going to be very testing. I think he's still well uh, off a good mark. I think he's well handicapped. But I still think he's competitively handicapped. So... I'm hoping that he'll um, get back to winning ways and what's been an amazing time for him. Again, he's progressed no end this season, but I just still think there's a little bit more to come from him, so he's going to be mine. Yeah, that's in the 120 at Aintree, mm. the handicap hurdle on Saturday, currently 8-1 to one with Bet365. What's the treble then? Give us a treble. Uh, it's a big price currently, um, <laughs> and it's in a race that we haven't covered yet. It's the conditional jockey's handicap hurdle on Friday, oh, yeah. the, the last race, and it's Densworth. Um, I put him up on this show. Uh, when he absolutely hacked up by 16 lengths at Doncaster um, on heavy ground and he's only £10 higher here. Looking back through that form, he's extremely leniently treated up £10. The second that day, Getaway Drumley, who's also trained by mm. Paul, Ben Paulding, uh, won by 17 lengths on his next start and he's up £10. I think he's overpriced in this because he pulled up in it last season. But Ben Paulding's, a lot of them had a bit of trouble with wind. Uh, he's had a wind operation and he scoped dirty after that. Um, prior to that, he'd won by nine and a half lengths, 29 lengths, and uh, Bo Morgan's going to be riding. I think he's brilliant value for, for five pounds. Yeah. So he's currently available at 20 to one. Lovely. So Densworth, that treble pays well, actually. It certainly yeah, does. That's <laughs> right, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Go back and find a few shorter ones. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> that, that, that can pay for your four goes in the Grand National anyway. Yeah, and the rest. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us this week uh, on this episode of Racing Weekly, brought to you by Oz Checker in association with Bet365. Many thanks to both Hayley and Johnny for joining me this week. As always, if you've liked what you've heard or watched in this or any of our previous episodes, then please give us a kind review on Apple Podcasts or in the comments section on YouTube. Myself and Rishi will be back next week to have a look ahead to the Scottish Grand National Card at Air. <laughs>